Okay, welcome everyone um, to the United Policyholders webinar on how to read and understand your insurance policy. Um, I'm sorry, it's probably because you've suffered a uh, fire or some disaster um, this year that you found yourself uh, in, in, in needing to take a webinar like this. So um, I am sorry for that. And what we're going to do is try to get through and help you understand these increasingly complicated uh, contracts that the insurance companies are selling and um, so that you can help yourself get through the claim process. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay. And we are presenting this um, in Spanish on a Spanish channel. Oops. Um, and so if you, and I apologize, I would try to pronounce all that, but my Spanish is quite rusty. But if you go here to interpretation, you can choose your language and there will be interpretation on the uh, second audio. Um, channel. Here's another, another thing there. So, okay. And then when you hit that, this is what you get. You get off and on. Okay. So this is how to read and understand your homeowner's insurance policy. We have a lot to go through today. Um, so I'm just going to get, get right into it. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sandra Watts, and I am um, the insurance specialist in the Roadmap to Recovery program for United Policyholders. Um, I have been involved in insurance claims and claims management for way too long now. Um, I'm also um, uh, have a background in the restoration industry, so I have a fire and water um, restoration experience and um, all sorts of different things. So I'm here to help you with your policy. For those of you um, who are joining us for the first time, United Policyholders is a 501c3 um, not-for-profit charitable organization. Um, just like the Red Cross, we're an old-fashioned charity and we're here and our mission um, is to be a voice and information resource for insurance consumers in all 50 states. Um, we've been around for 30 years. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary um, with a nice little uh, celebration. And so we've been around and we've got a lot of uh, expertise in the subject matter of insurance and disaster recovery. So we are not for profit, we're not for sale, and we are funded entirely by grants and donations. And those grants and donations allow us to bring you programs like this uh, free of charge. So we really appreciate our funders. Um, we also have a great group of volunteers who work uh, hand in hand with our very small staff here at United Policyholders. We have attorneys, adjusters, CPAs, you know, all sorts of different um, professionals um, who help us with the technical end. And we have a very large group of former disaster survivors who um, after it's over and someday it will be over, um, they come back and they help people like you um, with their personal experience. And um, we have a survivor to survivor program, which is really um, has been expanded, which is really great for this. Okay. Um, I wanna, do we have a housekeeping slide? I'm not sure where it is. Um, I guess I'll get to it. Um, we do have three programs and go through this fast. This is a roadmap to recovery program. We focus on getting people back in after disasters. We also have a preparedness program um, to try to prevent disasters from happening in the first place and an advocacy and action that um, helps with uh, things like friend of the court briefs and other things that are of concern to the insurance consumers. Okay, so team up, uh, we talked about this, we've got a professional staff, we've got government and nonprofit partners, and we have 
our volunteers. I want to say thank you right up front to RC and RC, RCRC and Golden State Finance Authority. Um, these are the two funders for our 2021 California wildfires. So we really appreciate them um, bringing this to you. Okay, so here's the housekeeping. Uh, the workshop is intended to be general guidance only, not legal advice. I'm not an attorney. Um, but even if I were, um, I would tell you if you had a specific legal question, um, we recommend you consult an experienced attorney. Um, we do have a fine group of sponsors listed at uphelp.org um, who also come and speak at our workshops. And um, while we know them and trust them, we do not warrant their work. Okay, so. I'm gonna start this off by um, our best practices. We do this every time. Get everything in writing, keep it professional, be concise, you know, bullet points, um, and, and really keep that stuff moving, okay? Um, and these are just really quick things before we get into the meat of, of, of the issue here. Um, we also recommend you start a claim diary. You're at the beginning of this journey, unfortunately, it may take some time and having a dedicated place where you can record and keep track of things is very, very um, helpful, okay? Um, this is one of our recommendations is to speak up, present your, your request clearly and in writing, explain what you need. Um, and at the bottom there is a really important part. Keep a working copy of your policy and practice the sentence. Can you show me where it says that in my policy? And use that sentence a lot when you hear you know, pushback or you hear something's not covered and so forth. Okay, so getting into the meat. Uh, today's topic is how to read and understand your policy. And um, we're gonna teach you how to navigate your insurance policy how to determine all of your available benefits, uh, how to understand the lingo and claim rules, um, how you know specific things like depreciation code upgrades and extended benefits work. And then I'm gonna give you a little uh, quick rundown on California insurance codes. Um, as strange as it may seem, California is one of the most consumer friendly uh, I just got a little reminder, English speakers need to click on English as well. So hopefully you guys have figured that out so um, you can hear me. Um, if you have questions, we've got a lot of slides today. If you have questions, um, type them in the Q&A. Uh, at least our staff attorney is back there um, trying to help. Oopsie, I went backwards accidentally. Um, and you can raise your hand, um, but we want to try to save, and we'll keep a look on it if it's a question that's germane, but we're going to try to save questions um, for our Q&A sessions. Um, we'll start those pretty soon where we have, whoopsie, it's jumping around tonight, where we have um, dedicated webinars. You can write in with your question and uh, we go through those. So I'll let you know when that next one is happening. Okay. Where to start? So in order to read your policy, you need a copy of your policy, okay? Request this in writing, um, ask for a certified copy um, so that you can make sure it's current and correct. Um, however, uh, there is an insurance code and it's they're only legally required to provide you with a complete and accurate copy. Um, you gotta check it and I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, I've seen so many cases, even in litigation, where um, the policy produced is not the actual policy <laughs> that was sold. So it's very important. We do have a sample letter um, in uphelp.org slash samples. There is a sample letter that you can modify to request your policy. Um, in California, they have 30 days to provide it. In California Department of Insurance, that's what CDI is. They can help you if you have issues, okay? And then again, make a working copy of the policy so you can highlight it and write on it and, and keep notes and then have a nice clean one as well, okay? Okay, this is just a copy of the sample letter. Um, we also have um, 
an overview document that's a simplified guide to your insurance policy that you can find on our website. Our website is fantastic. So I really encourage you all um, to visit it. Uh, we have a little search bar. You can look for things. It's, it's really the amount of information in there is just amazing. Um, David's asking if do we only do we ask for the certified copy only if making a claim? You know, uh, the law, it's a very interesting question. The law actually says that they can provide you, they have to provide you at least one uh, copy of the policy per year, even if you don't have a claim. Okay, so you, yeah, you can still ask for it. Um, Mobile and manufactured homes, these slides are in there. Um, just to let you know that this program will apply. It's almost similar language. You have the same buckets. The valuation is the same. Um, every once in a while, there's some title issues with mobile homes that are a little bit more like automobiles than houses, um, but um, it's basically the same. Also renters policies. Renters policies are the same as homeowners policies except they don't cover the structure of your home or the exterior, okay? That's your landlord's responsibility, okay? Okay, so a complete copy of your policy. So you write to your insurance company and you say, I want a complete and current copy of my insurance policy. They send you some stuff. How do you know if it's complete and current, okay? So there's a few things that you should be getting. First and importantly is a declarations page. Now I get a lot of people when I say, oh, let me take a look at your policy for you. Um, they say, okay, I'll send you the policy and they send me the declarations page. Um, that is the cover sheet and I'll have some examples here, but that's the cover sheet that tells you your name, the location of the property, the date of the policy and all the forms, okay? So that's just the cover sheet. <laughs> um, then it also includes um, a California residential property insurance disclosure, which is super helpful. And I'll show you an example of that, as well as the California residential property bill of rights, also helpful. Okay, the policy form. Usually the policy forms are in little booklets. Let's see, I have one right here. So it's a little booklet. I thought I did, here's a fair plan policy. And like the State Farm one is folded in threes. This is a fair plan, whoops, kind of weird to see with my background. This is a fair plan policy. They're in little booklets, okay? Um, and I'll also get to it soon, but right here in little places at the bottom in tiny, tiny, tiny small print is the form and the form number that we'll refer to in a minute, okay? Um, so you'll get your declarations page, the enclosures, the policy form, and then endorsements. Endorsements are um, additions to the policies. They either add coverage or take away coverage, okay? So they modify, they modify the policy. Um, and, uh, hold on. The chat is disabled for, um, for the attendees, at least. So if you just put the, the links in the um, Q&A, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, she's gonna add a link to um, some of the things I refer to. So um, that's why we're doing that. Okay, and then you have some other notice and compliance pages. Um, these are um, important messages about your policy. You'll see um, when they change a policy and modify it, um, on an uh, existing policy, say you're renewing your policy and they've changed something during that year, they're required to notify you of those changes. And those are what the other, um, the other notice and compliance pages are. They're super important because they do alert you of potential reductions in coverage. Okay, so um, it's really, um, overwhelming, I think is a good word, uh, when you get these packets of information. Um, but if you break them down um, and try to look at all of them, um, you'll, be, you'll be getting in the right place. Okay, so let's start with the declarations, okay? These declarations are key 
to your insurance payments because this really is, you know, show me the money. Um, not all of them look the same, but they all are required to contain the same basic information. There, is, there are laws that tell them what they have to contain. So the name of the insured, okay? So um, insurance is so, you know, complicated that in general, the name of the insured is you and your spouse. Um, there's some other people like your children who also might be insured under the policy, but um, really we're talking about the main person, okay? Location of the property, um, the effective date, it's also referred to as the policy period, okay? Um, it's going to list your major coverages, that's like your building, your contents, um, your additional living expenses, and then the limits of liability for those coverages, which is, which means um, the amount that they're, you know, that the property is insured for, okay? So they also have to list the policy forms and endorsements that you have because you might have one set of endorsements and forms and your neighbor might have another set. There's certain things you can add and subtract. You can add jewelry, you can add sewer backup, you can add um, business property, all sorts of different things. And um, so, so these are really important that you look at yours. This reminds me as well that even if you and your neighbor are say both insured with farmers, um, be careful because uh, a lot of companies and farmers is really kind of the main one, but all of them are getting there. They sell different policies. The same company sells different policies. So you might be talking to a neighbor who has a different policy than you have, even though you're both insured with the same company. Okay. So deductibles, um, I don't know why it says or deductibles. <laughs> I think this is this is meant to say that um, it's becoming increasingly uh, more common to um, have multiple deductibles. Okay, so there might be a um, overall policy deductible that applies to all losses, and that's the that's the really common way. But now certain policies are saying, well, we have kind of a high risk. So if it's a, if it's a wind claim, we're gonna charge a different deductible. Or if it's a theft claim, we're gonna charge a different deductible. So you need to be on the lookout for that, okay? It'll also have information on your mortgage company um, because in most cases they are a party to your insurance policy and in most cases need to be listed um, on any payments if you um, have a loss. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some samples. This is a State Farm homeowner's policy. Um, you can see the insured, you can see the policy number. This is your policy period with your effective dates, um, location. I mean, we blanked it out here to private, you know, for privacy reasons. Here are your coverages. Um, there's little things you need to look for, like these little sneaky things. This policy doesn't provide coverage for earthquake. This policy includes business code upgrade coverage of 117,375. Okay. Um, here's an example of the deductible. This one is for all losses, $3,000. Okay. So here, these are your coverages and your coverage limits. And we'll go and I'll show you some of these. And then down here are your forms and endorsements. Okay, with your policy form and see this FP 7955-CA, whoopsie. That is usually found in tiny, tiny, small print as I'm trying again to hold a policy with the weird background. Anyway, it's on the packet itself. So this is a second declaration page just to show you how different they can be. This is an AMCO um, uh, policy. You've got your policy period. You still got, see how we have kind of the same information. It's just, you have to look for it in different places. Here's the mortgagee. Here are your coverage and coverage limits. This one's kind of nice because it's a little bit easier to see your coverages. 
Um, and we'll go through all the letters on all these. This is all of the forms and endorsements. This is why the packet you get um, is so thick because each one of these um, little codes here represents, uh, like this one represents the policy form itself. This one is a special little endorsement for workers comp. This one's for replacement cost for property. Um, and then here, like your important notices, which are, you know, additions or reductions of coverage um, and so forth, okay? So the third one, because a bunch of you out there might have fair plan policies, this is a sample California fair plan declarations page. There, I kind of like it uh, the way they have these laid out because they're pretty clear um, for most of the um, the coverages. I like that it shows you straight on the page what you're covered for with little check marks. Hopefully, you look at this before you have a loss. Um, there are a few little sneaky things in there, but um, for the most part, this is a pretty pretty easy one uh, to read. And I didn't include the part that had the form, so it's a two it's a two part. Okay, so this is what I was calling the um, well, I didn't call it. It's named um, the California Residential Insurance Disclosure. The reason that this is important, um, this is the product of a lawsuit for um, people who didn't know uh, whether or not they had certain coverages on their policy. Um, the legislature went ahead and mandated that under the insurance code that each customer receives one of these disclosures and they have to check off which of these items that you have, okay? And whether you have replacement costs, and we'll get into this, extended replacement costs, guaranteed is very rarely found. I've seen a couple recently, but very few. And whether or not you have building code upgrade, okay? Um, okay, Cindy's asking about option OL ordinance or law and what does it cover? And that is what I'm gonna do is go through all of the coverages as we go on. So we'll get to that, Cindy. Um, thanks for the question. Okay, <laughs> and here we go, right in this. And we're gonna keep drilling down as we go through it um, because some of you, uh, obviously Cindy knows that she's got option OL, which is this, right here, ordinance or law, and it's 25% right here. Some of you might not know if you have it or not, okay? And sometimes your declarations page will not help you with that. So this is State Farm, it lists it pretty clearly. I like it when it has the percentage and the dollar amount because it really gets rid of any questions. This one, I can't remember where I pulled these from. I think this, I don't know which is this from, but this one, you know, if you look on your declarations, if you don't see like um, ordinance or law or replacement costs, that's what ERC is extended replacement cost coverage. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But like this, if you look for replacement costs, you might have it. And then this is a Liberty Mutual policy. And there's really no way to tell from this um, declarations page whether you have um extended replacement cost or, or code upgrade coverage. Um, okay, um, I see the questions and we're gonna get to that as we go along. Okay, um, so moving on, this is the California Residential Property Insurance Bill of Rights. Um, this is another way uh, where the legislature is saying, hey, you're entitled to a copy of your policy. Um, this is a really important one because I'm seeing some insurers who don't ever write an estimate. They just say to get one yourself. The law says this is actually a simplified version of an insurance code. Um, but in the event of a claim, you're entitled to a written estimate. OK, it's also important that you're entitled to select a contractor of your choice. OK. OK, so. If you take the declarations page and the policy, that's going to give you the amount of your maximum available benefits. And I'm going to show you how these all add up. So you here have a declarations page and it's like three three hundred thousand two hundred dollars. OK, so a lot of people 
I'll say, well, have you been paid? And they say, yeah, they paid me my full dwelling limit. Okay, and that's $300,200. Well, let me tell you that there's all sorts of little hidden add-ons that really add up as, um, as you move through your claim. So it really is more, way more than this. And I will show you as we, as we move along. Okay. So now we're going to get into the booklet. Okay. These little booklets that we're talking about, and I'm going to go through these. It's a little bit tedious, but it's super important because then you're going to learn where you need to look if you have a question. Okay. And to get, get yourself going. Let's see. Okay, and some of the questions here, I'm going to try my best to answer these at the end. I'm going to stay in the flow because we do have a lot, but I see Debbie and Alice, I see your questions, and I'm going to either try to answer them when we get to that section or, um, or do it at the end. Um, so I'm not ignoring you. I see the questions and we will get there, but I don't want to interrupt the stream of uh, what we're doing here. So definitions in the policy, they tell us what certain words mean, okay? Um, if the term that you're working with isn't defined, um, the courts say that you have to use the common meaning of the word, okay? And that's usually found in the dictionary, okay? How do you know? Most policies, um, if you're reading through and you'll see these words and all of a sudden you'll come across a word that's in bold, you know, it'll be like, the insured or, you know, different things like that. When it's bold, that means that that word is defined in the policy and you can go to the policy definitions, just like a dictionary and look up what that word means in terms of your insurance policy, okay? Some of the policies use quotes to identify uh, defined words, but it's the same idea, okay? Important terms, insured, Building, structure, actual cash value, property damage, those are all words that we're gonna go, we're gonna go through. Okay, here's examples. Um, I will go through these fast, but this is a state, these are state farm policy. Here's how state farm does it. And so for instance, um, here's a CSAA policy and a nationwide policy, both with actual cash value. Um, and this is, they have different definitions, okay? Um, keep in the back of your head that in California, our insurance code has modified some of these definitions, okay? And I'll show you when we get to, to the insurance laws, but um, actual cash value um, with respect to your dwelling um, or your structure doesn't mean fair market value anymore, okay? And if the policy conflicts with the law, the state law is the one that you know, determines, determines who wins. So the state always wins over the policy language pretty much. Okay, so that's, these are just examples. Okay, so the policy coverages tell us what specifically is covered. It's the broad language is like, what is the insurance company insuring? They're mostly um, defined by letters. The letters differ a little bit by company, but for the most part, coverage A is your dwelling, that's your house structure. Um, coverage B is dwelling extensions. Um, for instance, State Farm doesn't, coverage B is contents. Um, so they're a little bit different, but dwelling extension or other structures, you've got personal property and loss of use. Those are the big four, okay? Um, renters policies are the same without coverage A protection because you don't own the house. Okay, so here's some examples. Each of the policy uh, specifies what they're covering. Okay, and I'm not going to read this to you. And by the way, we are recording and we will have this available so you can go back. We'll have a slide deck that's static that you can just read and we'll have the recording um, if you need to watch again because this is a ton of information. Okay. And people spend their whole careers uh, uh, studying this information. Might not be everyone's career. Um, so these are two examples, two different policies, um, uh, State Farm, and I think this is CSAA. But in general, Cover J covers your main house, and most of them pay for, you know, they have little add-ons like 
materials and supplies located on or adjacent to the residence premises, okay? Foundations and carpeting. So really, if you had a bunch of stuff stored outside next to your house that, because say you were getting ready to build something, you wouldn't necessarily think that was part of your house claim if it all burns, but it actually is. So that's why it's important to know that you can claim these things, okay? Coverage B is generally other structures, also called dwelling extension. Um, a lot of times we see a lot of people who run out of limits um, because most of the policies give you a standard 10% of your dwelling limit for this portion. Um, and we see a lot of people in rural areas with barns and fences and um, retaining walls. Know that most of those which are structures, um, but not your house, are considered other structures or dwelling extensions. So um, if you have a lot of these other um, building structures or um, fences or retaining walls, other structures, then you might wanna talk to your um, agent or broker and uh, because some companies let you increase this, but this is one of the areas where we see people running out of money a lot, okay? And understand that the definition, again, um, varies by company to company. And so one company uh, might put everything in there. Um, some companies, it might be landscaping. These are just examples of the way they're, um, that they're written. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is that if you've got like a, um, and this is really important because of the new ADUs and um, accessory dwelling units that um, are in California now that a lot of the policies um, exclude coverage if you have another building that's rented or held for rental to a separate like a separate tenant. It's okay if you have a tenant of the main house and they also have that other structure rented with the house. But if it's a separate rental, then you need a separate policy, okay? So um, again, when you see these words, you go back to the definition and see what qualifies as a separate structure, okay? And then this is an example of what it means. So if I'm looking here and then I want the definition, here's the definition. So buildings and building structures, okay? So or fences and, and driveways and so forth. Okay, so this is also important because there is a new law effective in 2019 in California that says um, that you can combine your coverage limits. Um, even if you don't rebuild, anyway, you can combine the coverage limits for your other structures into your main dwelling if you want to. Um, most people, most insurance companies let you do that anyway. Um, is an attached deck considered a dwelling extension? Most of the policies say that um, attached decks are part of the dwelling. Okay, most of the most of the policies say that other structures are separated from the main dwelling by clear space. Okay, so most of the time those are attached decks are part of the house. Okay, so coverage C contents um, covers your personal property owned by an insurance. Sorry, I'm going fast. I, I have to slow down for the interpreters. I'm a very fast talker, so I, I apologize for that. Um, the UP has a little fun, fun visualization. If you take the roof off your house and shake it, what falls out is personal property, but someone just pointed out to me the other day that they thought that their exterior contents or not personal property because of that, uh, that visual. So it does also include things like patio furniture and personal property that's outside, okay? Um, sometimes you have off-premises coverage. So if your stuff is somewhere else and it gets damaged, you might have coverage and you might have cover a little coverage for some guests property, um, which is like if it's at your house when it burns down. There's a lot of items that are subject to specific limits, okay? So we need to be aware of that. So here's just an example of the personal property coverage um, promise, okay? 
Okay, so the special limits, and these are things to be aware of. Money is usually limited, um, $150,000, $500,000 security, same thing. Uh, business property, this is a really big deal post-COVID because a lot of people work from home now, and in some cases have brought some really um, uh, expensive equipment or supplies or anything like that into their homes. So if you have um, brought things into your house as a result of COVID, it's a good time to revisit um, what's covered. There's a, some tiny uh, boat coverage for little things like canoes and rowboats and stuff. Same thing for some trailers, okay? Um, there are limits on jewelry, firearms, things like that, but most of those special limits are for theft, rugs, um, arts, things like that. And usually they're covered when a fire happens, okay? So property not covered, okay? This is really important. Um, items that are specifically insured, like if you have um, expensive jewelry, I don't have any to show you, but um, if you have jewelry and you have a, you know, it's worth a lot and you keep it um, specifically insured, it's not covered. Animals, birds, and fish. Um, although I have seen, uh, look at your policy, I can't, is it? Farmers might have a very small coverage if your pet is injured in a fire, which is really sad. Um, there might be some limited veterinary. Um, and somebody asked, are stuffed animals considered furs? I would say probably not, but um, they, they might be if they're like made of mink or something like that. So most of the time stuffed animals are not, um, are not. Um, so animals, birds, and fish, properties of your tenants, rumors, or borders are specifically excluded. So if you rent a room to someone, rent an ADU to someone, their contents are not covered, okay? Motor vehicles are not covered, even if they're, um, there's some exceptions for certain vehicles not registered for use on roads um, and for handicapped assistance. But like if you have an old car, and it's not registered because it's just sitting there, um, that's generally not covered. RVs are generally not covered. They want you to buy specific policies. Okay, ALE coverage, loss of use. ALE is additional living expenses. Um, this one is the most variable coverage, okay? And the coverage and limits vary greatly by company. You really need to check your declarations page um, because some of the policies, um, uh, have a actual loss sustained, which means that um, there is no top limit. A State Farm's policy, although they're in the process of changing that policy, uh, Liberty, uh, all state, I believe, have actual loss sustained policies, means that no matter um, how much um, they will pay. Some have a limit on money. You know, it says specifically there, you know, $100,000 or whatever. Some have a time limit. Okay. And we'll talk about the statutory time limit, the law on time limit in California. Um, and then some have a money and time limit. Um, and yes, we've had two questions on loss of use for second home. So we'll hit that later in the thing. Um, so check your policies for coverage. Um, there's also different ways it can be paid. Uh, additional living expenses, which is um, actual costs you incur to maintain your standard of living. Fair rental value, which is the value um, that you could have rented your home for. And then um, this prohibited use civil authority is evacuation coverage, okay? Here's just an example of a policy that has a specific coverage limit. So it's really important when you're looking for your temporary um, temporary home that you know if you have a money limit. Because if, say, for instance, you know, the cost uh, to rent a home in your area, say it's $10,000 a month, right? Well, you're going to run out of your loss of use really quickly if you do that. So you might want to scale down and not maintain your standard of living, okay? Um, so it's just important to know. Okay, oh, we have a little graphic, a little mover thing here. Come on. Okay. Um, 
So this is an example of a state farm, actual loss sustained. Here is a sample of state farm's current uh, policy. Like I said, they're changing it. Um, no limit, maintain. And this is really important. Most of the policies say a loss insured to the resident's premises makes it uninhabitable and will cover the in necessary increase in cost to maintain your standard of living. Okay, for up to 24 months. Um, state law extends that here, um, but it's really important because sometimes, uh, and Stan, yes, you can request a copy of your policy via email. Um, it's important to maintain your standard of living, especially if you have an unlimited policy. Okay, so this is just an example of a, this is a state farm endorsement. And this is an endorsement. This is one of, this is an example of an endorsement that changes your policy. And this specific endorsement um, brings their policy in line with California state law. Okay, and we'll go through that a little bit more, but it says, you know, you have to have 24 months, you can extend it for additional amounts of time. Okay, um, this is farmer's language. Uh, so, um, some of these policies, and this is, this is going to uh, tie into vacation homes. You've got to read the coverage because um, damage to the dwelling. So sometimes your home is uninhabitable, but it's not, the dwelling itself is not damaged. Say, um, that all your outbuildings burned or your well burned or um, you have no access. Um, the difference, and I'm going to go backwards here, between a resident's premises becoming uninhabitable, that's the whole premises. So if you go back and look at the thing, your whole premises becomes uninhabitable versus just your dwelling, just your home. So you've got to look at that. Um, and it talks about maintaining your standard of living. Some of the policies say that it has to be your primary residence. Um, I have an issue with that because, you know, they're taking premiums as if it was your primary residence, but um, they, you know, if the policy says it, you're kind of stuck with it. So um, for all of you who have a vacation home, it depends, and we can talk about this at the end, but it depends greatly on which insurance policy you have, okay? Um, this is a AAA policy. AAA has a very unique thing um, where if you have a loss covered, it makes your residence premises uninhabitable, you get your choice. Oops, this is in a weird place. We cover at your, op at your option, okay? So you get to choose either, oopsie, I'm a tricky mouse today. Um, your additional living expense, and they define it, meaning any necessary and reasonable increase in living expenses incurred by you so that your household can maintain its normal standard of living. So incurred means spent, okay? That you have to spend it, they reimburse you for it. Fair rental value means the fair rental value of that part of the residence premises where you reside, like your whole house generally. Um, here it is, look here. Second residences are covered for additional living expenses only, okay? So that's really an example of why, like to answer your question about uh, ALE or loss of use for second residences, um, it's not a, a quick answer, it's policy specific, okay? That's why you have to learn how to read and understand your policy. Okay, this is just a little quickie slide on the difference between ALE, actual costs incurred, meaning spent, um, fair rental value is a negotiated amount based upon the fair rental value of the home you lost. Highly negotiable, a negotiated amount. Um, a lot of times um, you'll see there's like, you have to use Zillow. That is not the, tr the case. You have to use a fair value of what your home would rent for if it was still there. Okay, check your policies. Um, and remember, and we're seeing this more and more, even if you don't have that policy that says you have your 
entitled to fair rental value, you can always ask for it. And sometimes you can negotiate um, to get that instead of um, having to incur it and send in, send in uh, your receipts. Okay, I love this slide, even though I made it, but um, I love it because it breaks down your ALE length. Okay, when a loss insured, and this is just general, but it's a good, good overview. A loss insured, okay, most of you have had a fire, I'm sorry, um, causes the resident's premises, okay, we've already seen some policy says dwelling, okay, but in general, your house, to become uninhabitable, means unfit to live in, and if all those things are met, you should be owed ALE under most policies, okay? So some policies say that it has to be your property that is, that's damaged and others do not, okay? So sometimes the off-premises, okay? So really quickly, because ALE is always a hot topic, in general, what you're owed is increased costs, meaning over and above what you normally spend, okay? So if you own your home, you have to continue to pay your mortgage and your temporary rental is an increased cost. Okay, and we have some examples there. If you're, rent, if you're a renter and you usually pay 1500 a month, but now you have to pay 2000, then 500 is the increased cost, okay? Um, we've got lots of second, second homes here, I guess, cause we're out in the thing. So we'll get to that at the end. Okay, and it talks about food and utilities. So just be aware, and you've probably already been asked that your insurer um, may ask you to provide estimates for the amount that you normally spend so that they can pay you that amount that's above, okay? Okay, this is another slide. What are you owed? You're owed to maintain your standard of living, okay? So um, I see a lot of cases, especially, you know, you have to be mindful because like I said earlier, if you have a low coverage limit, then maintaining your standard of living, you know, if you have five bedrooms and a pool and a gated community and all that, um, might not be as important as making the money that you have last the whole period of time that you're out of your home. So you really need to balance there, okay? Um, one of the other things is, is that, um, it's not automatic, okay? Even the 24 months is not automatic. Now, the 24 months, they're gonna be pretty hard pressed not to give it to you, but um, especially renters, they really put the squeeze on renters pretty soon because they're like, look, um, you know, you can just go find another place to live, you know? Anyway, it's not automatic. Um, it's the short, whoops, the shortest time to repair replace or for your household to settle elsewhere. There's a lot of factors um, that tie into that. So we'll get into that, okay? These are all things that qualify for additional living expenses, even things like if you have to pay to set up your utilities, um, if you have to buy a renter's policy, um, if you, whoopsie, if you have to have moving costs and fix my mouse, um, pet boarding, um, and we get a lot of questions about like lots of pets. Um, in general, they have to be household pets and not farm animals. Um, insurance companies are required now to give you a copy of a list of things that qualify. So um, you can ask them for that, okay? Be creative. ALE is one of the most negotiable parts of your insurance policy. So creativity is really something um, especially if you're concerned that your dollar limit won't last um, the whole length of time. Um, negotiations can sometimes leave you with less. So if you have an actual loss incurred policy. So, uh, you know, we saw a lot of people after um, the big paradise fire um, who had, you know, like regular single family homes. Um, the housing crisis was so profound that they, had to they went and they rented a you know two bedroom apartment and then or they negotiated an rv well the challenges involved in that fire are so huge that you know two years later they're still living in an rv and they're not very happy about that so think about again it's being mindful of what your policy provides okay 
So you can, these are different things you can do. You can ask for fair rental value, okay, versus as incurred. Sometimes if they can, if you can negotiate maybe a little less on the FRV, but you don't have to, you don't have to spend it and you don't have to turn on receipts, then they might do it. Some negotiate a lump sum. Um, sometimes people buy a fifth wheel or an RV, a tiny home. Um, another home you own, I'm not really sure why. The, the, whoopsie, the insurers are so weird about another. Okay, this is driving me crazy. Sorry. Um, another home that you own, I can't operate mouse today. Um, but a lot of them are like, no, you cannot live there you know, and they end up getting the benefit of that, you know, and so if you have a second, if your primary home burns, and you have a second home, um, a lot of times you can negotiate an amount, like if it would cost them, you know, 5,000 a month to live in a rental, but you own something, maybe you can negotiate a few thousand dollars a month um, to live in your second home. Um, so, uh, and also remind them that you could be renting it out and you're not getting the rent. So you are, you know, suffering a loss. The long and short of it is if you don't ask for it, you won't get it, okay? And the worst that can happen is they can say no. So be creative, okay? I'm sorry, I'm just a talking head here. So I have to have some water. Okay, when I was talking before about how all the coverages sort of stack up and, and result in more, um, this, is, this is an example. Um, additional coverages, debris removal, tree shrubs and plants, temporary repairs, refrigerated products. These things can all add on top of your coverage A limit. So let's, let's look at them. Debris removal, you might um, be familiar with this already. Debris removal is super confusing, okay? I'm gonna try to break it down because people will, will write in and they'll say, oh my gosh, you know, they put debris removal under my coverage A, they shouldn't have done that. It's, it goes over here in this 5% bucket. Um, the way the debris removal works is that say you have, you know, $50,000 of, cost to get your old house off the property, get everything taken away. That part goes, gets paid under coverage A in your policy, under your dwelling limit. Once you hit the limit, okay, once that coverage A limit is hit, then that opens up the 5%. So it's not like the debris goes into the five, gets paid out of the 5% coverage limit straight up front. It goes out of the building until the limits hit, then you get the 5%. So it just adds another 5%. You can move it over and then gives you more cost to rebuild, whatever. Um, but that's how it works. It's super confusing. I wish they did it differently, but that's, um, keep in mind that some policies do not have the additional 5%. Most do, but some don't. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, some of you might be uh, already familiar with the FEMA Consolidated Debris Removal Program. Um, uh, I've seen, uh, we hear the whole gamut, fantastic, terrible, the whole way. Um, you just really need to weigh the pros and cons. If you're severely underinsured, then I would, I would recommend that you look carefully at the debris removal program because it can shift a significant portion of the cost to remove debris out of your insurance and into, so that leaves you more to rebuild. Excuse me. Um, some policies have 5% for contents and other structures and so forth. Look at your policy and see if the 5% applies to all coverages. It says contents, but sometimes it applies. There's a separate 5% that, that goes on that um, other structure. So think about this. The math gets kind of complicated because if your other structures is 10% of your coverage A and then you get 5% of that, it's, it's crazy. We're really um, in need of some simplification, okay? Um, also, debris coverage usually, now there's some exceptions, 
but usually does not include any coverage for trees, shrubs, and plants, including the debris of trees, shrubs, and plants, okay? So we'll get to that one, but um, in, in most cases, it doesn't include it. Um, take, it's always good to take photos to document um, debris. Try not to sift, it's pretty toxic stuff. Um, if you're taking pictures, try to take pictures of things that are still recognizable um, so that you can use those to, you know, uh, jog your memory. Okay, here's some examples of, from State Farm and Farmers of debris removal language. Um, just what it's saying, um, when the amount payable for the property damage plus debris removal exceeds your limits for the damaged property. So this particular policy, it applies across all the limits, all the coverage, so coverage A, coverage B, it doesn't apply to C because um, State Farm C is ALE and that doesn't have debris. Um, and it says this additional amount of insurance does not apply to trees, shrubs, and plants. Okay, here's a farmer's. Um, this one specifically says A, B, or C stated limit. Okay, you get your 5%. Here's things it doesn't cover. It, cover. Um, and you know they go into contamination here, but generally the fire damage, if the you know the fire causes the nasty debris, they cover, they pay for that. Okay, so let's hit trees, shrubs, and plants here. Trees, plants, and shrubs covers um, the landscaping for specific perils. It's like fire, lightning, wind, uh, not windstorm, vehicles. There's only a few. Um, it's generally 5%, sometimes 10%. It's everything. Um, one of the unfortunate things that we see is that, um, I'm gonna open the window here. You can see I'm getting really warm, hold on. Um, we see a lot of people in these wildfire areas or more rural areas, and there's a lot of trees and beautiful timber and all of this that is just was just never intended to be covered by a homeowner's policy. I live in San Francisco. I have a really huge tree, which is unusual for San Francisco, but I have one um, in some little other little trees. But um, these homeowner's policies, when they were developed, were really intended for people, you know, like me in the city or little suburban families who, you know, have a little lawn and a little fence and all that. Um, okay, I'm going to get to these questions here at the end, and I'm going to save some time. So if you hang in here, I'll get them to you. Um, so uh, anyway, that's why there's so many people, they're like, well, they paid me my limit, my 5% tree limit, but I have, whoopsie, I have all this debris and now they won't pay it out of the debris removal. So like I said, again, it's very, it's it's a big gap in insurance coverage. So um, yeah, and I don't, uh, the tree, the damaged tree is covered. Yeah, I see Cindy um, asking there about the damaged trees covered. Um, it's a very interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, okay. Trees, plants, and shrubs. This is Liberty Mutual and Farmers. These are just examples, like here are the perils. There's just a few perils, but most of you, um, unfortunately, have had a fire, so that is covered. Um, some of them have, most of them have limits per item, $500 for one tree, shrub, or plant, um, $750 here for tree, shrub, or plant. Um, and except, this is exactly what I was talking about, except as provided therein, debris removal for tree shrubs and plants and lawns is not covered under your debris removal coverage, okay? So I've seen a couple, but it's it's pretty rare. Okay, so refrigerated products. Um, this is a tough, whoopsie, this is a tough one. We see a lot of, um, these are smoke claims, usually when part of it's, um, uh, the house is still standing. Um, just know that there's some extended coverage there. Okay, so now we're gonna get into 
what types of losses are insured, okay? And I'm gonna hit these pretty, pretty fast because you guys generally um, are having covered losses, fire is covered. Um, there's two types, there's all risk, also called broad form. And this is what we see most often, accidental direct losses. And then there's some policies that list, that only cover specific, what they call named perils, okay? And different portions of your coverage can use, have different insured losses. So you need to look, okay? These are just examples of all risk, what we call all risk policies, accidental direct physical loss at State Farm. This is a farmer's down here, okay? And in general, they say, hey, anything that's um, a direct physical loss, you know, they always say sudden and accidental. If it's not excluded, it's cover. Okay. So that's one of the ways to think about, think about that. Um, these are examples of the name peril. So these are like, a, you see these a lot on personal property um, portions of the policy where they're like, hey, we just insure these. These are the most common um, from, uh, there's a, uh, kind of a standardized policy called an ISO policy, insurance services organization. Um, and they publish policy forms that a lot of companies use. Um, but um, these are examples. These come from it. Fire, lightning, smoke. Okay, those are your main ones. Okay. So loss is not insured is a fancy way of them saying exclusion. So sometimes it'll say policy exclusions. Sometimes it'll say uh, loss is not insured. Super complicated. Um, the courts spend all their time trying to decide what little words mean. We've seen a lot of um, this with uh, the COVID um, business interruption cases for you know restaurants and other businesses that were shut down due to COVID. Um, Try, you know, you can get really in the mud pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so try not to get too far down the rabbit hole, um, ask for clarification. Um, also, though, know that a lot of policies, you'll see an exclusion, like a code upgrade exclusion, okay? And you'll think, oh, I don't have code upgrades. However, most of the time, the policy takes out code upgrades because they didn't always used to be covered. And then they add it back in with an endorsement. This is the reason why endorsements are so important because you could look at your policy and you could be like, oh, I don't have code upgrade coverage and then not see that one little piece of paper that's you know buried in the stack of little pieces of paper that says you actually do. Um, one of the things that's really important is that California is a predominant cause state. So, and this was an issue um, last year in the 2020, especially in the Santa Cruz mountains, where, you know, if fire, you know, burns all the wood on the hillsides, and then the hillside uh, slides in a rainstorm, they're actually, um, that is actually caused by the fire, but for, they say, but for the fire, um, that hillside wouldn't have slid. So you've got some, you've got some coverage for that. Okay, so these are just examples of exclusions, like I was saying, oh my goodness, uh, ordinance and law isn't covered, water damage isn't covered, um, but they do, they do add them back most of the time. It's just amazingly complicated. Okay, loss settlement provisions determine how your loss is going to be settled. It's a fancy way of saying, do you have replacement cost or not replacement cost? Now, one of the things where people get sort of surprised when they have, uh, especially a total loss is they say, well, I have a replacement cost policy. How on earth is it that I can't replace my house because I don't have enough money? Um, it doesn't actually refer to, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a misleading statement. It doesn't actually mean that you're automatically gonna get the money, all the money you need to replace your house. What it means is that you get to replace it with new. Actual cash value, if you think about, think about a car, okay? So you buy a car 
and you drive it off the lot, what you paid for that car new is its replacement cost. So if you get in a crash on the first day, total the car, the replacement cost is what you paid for it because you just bought it. Say you drive the car for 10 years, okay? Then you total the car. Um, that car that you maybe paid $20,000 for is maybe only worth you know, $5,000 or $10,000 now. That is the actual cash value, the price you could get on the market. Well, home policies used to work like car policies. So you don't get a new car. You don't like, oh, I crashed my you know, 10 year old car. Now I get a brand new one. You get another, the payment for a 10 year old car. Home policies used to act that way, okay? And they used to say, okay, we're gonna depreciate everything that's wearing out. Well, there's a big difference between, how, you know, you can go buy a 10 year old car, right? You can't go buy, you know, 10 year old lumber to replace your, your house with. So um, it was a big um, financial hit for people to have actual cash value policies. And we're seeing them come back. We're seeing them come back with a vengeance, um, roofs, fences, and decks. Um, a lot of the policies are saying a uh, carpet, or they're saying they're only going to pay actual cash value. But what the insurers did was they added, it was kind of a marketing tool when it was first introduced. And they said, hey, you know, if you have this loss, you get not only, you know, the cost to replace your carpet, but you get new carpet and we're going to pay you for that. And um, most of the time you have to spend it to get it. You can't, you know, pocket the, the amount and then live with it. But um, it's really, it's a really valuable coverage, but it doesn't mean that they're going to pay all the way up to the cost to replace your house. Um, it still stops at the policy limit. Okay, and that's one thing that I see people asking a lot about. Um, again, the lost settlement provisions are often modified by endorsements, especially in California. There's always a California a mandatory endorsement, and in there they change things. Okay, um, a lot of policies say that reimbursement they'll reimburse you to the amount actually and necessarily spent for covered repairs up to the policy limit. So some people, if you have the cash flow to complete the repairs and you repair it, like you don't upgrade it or change it or anything, then you can just repair it. Um, you need to check your policy and um, repair it and turn in the receipt and they'll reimburse you for it if, instead of having to wait for them to you know, give you approval, okay? So this is an example of a loss settlement provision that has personal property settled at actual cash value, okay? So all of the personal property in this policy is ACV. So if you have, you know, a, a five-year-old computer, they're maybe gonna give you 20% of, you know, however fast they wear out, okay? Awnings, carpeting, appliances, outdoor antenna, structures that are not buildings, okay? So this is something to look out for. Now, sometimes this is in the policy and then you have an endorsement that says, hey, we've got a replacement cost endorsement here and it gives it back to you or maybe gives some of it back to you, okay? So if you see something like this, go dig through your stack and look for an endorsement. Like I said, um, we're doing a big um, a pr a program here at UP. It's called the Risk Initiative, and it is reducing insurance safety coverage gaps for insurance consumers. So there's a lot of things where people, you know, end up saying, oh, I don't have enough money to, to replace it. So we're trying to address um, some of the issue. Uh, so anyway, this is an example of a replacement cost policy, okay? And it talks about um, the fact that you get replacement costs. Um, but the, um, there's, it keeps going. Um, it says, you know, you have to, if it's more than 2,500, we'll pay the actual cash value until the actual repair or replacement is completed, okay? This is the, this is the language I was telling you. 
the reasonable and necessary amount actually spent to repair or replace the damaged property. So those are important to look at, okay? So these endorsements, and this is the last bit, and we'll get do a little bit on law and then I'll answer the questions. Um, endorsements, super important. They are part of your policy. They're very important to keep and read. They modify provisions. They can add or remove coverages. They can limit or expand coverages. Very common, there's a mold endorsements that say we're only gonna pay, um, Um, and David, I'll talk about your question there in a minute. Um, they can limit coverage. Say you only have $5,000 for mold. Um, some cover, uh, uh, companies are saying, oh, you only have $10,000 for water damage. Sometimes they conflict with the policy provisions, okay? Always ask for clarification if it doesn't make sense. Mm. And one thing I want to add is that um, in California, we have what's called like a standard fire policy, which means that all policies that insure for fire have to pay for it, fire and smoke explosion. Um, so if they try to limit smoke, um, that's, that's kind of a red flag. Okay, this is an example of a replacement cost um, endorsement. Okay, this is an endorsement that was dated in 2010 on a state farm policy. This one doesn't have that actual and necessary expense um, in there. So you've got to, got to be careful. This is, um, this is a copy of that ACV policy I was showing you earlier, um, where it says all those things are paid at actual cash value. Um, this is the endorsement. See this replacement cost? Look for these endorsements. And here's what it says. It says, okay. It says it's ACV, but you have replacement cost. Extended replacement cost. Okay, this is a juicy provision, okay? Most policies sold today have extended replacement provisions. Um, watch it if you have like a rental dwelling policy, something like that. And these provide additional funds to replace your home if you run out of coverage A limits, okay? If they're inadequate to repair or replace your dwelling, okay? Most of the language on ER, it's called ERC, is included in your loss settlement section or added by endorsement. They call them different things. Um, uh, all state calls it like visceral, building structure replacement limits or something like that. So you gotta look and see uh, the limits vary greatly. So the minimum is about 10%. I've seen some that are 200%. Um, most of the policies only apply those extended benefits to coverage A, but a few policies um, extend it to all your coverages. Okay. Um, these are extended replacement cost examples. Option ID, this is State Farm, increased dwelling. Okay. And it'll tell you in your declarations, how much? This one's 25%. This is a AAA policy. Um, they've got 150. One of the things that's really important is some of the policies say that um, if you do remodeling or upgrading, um, like this one is $5,000 or more. If you increase the value of your policy for $5,000 or more, and you don't tell your insurance company within 90 days, this goes away, okay? It's very hidden, it's very unusual. It was never enforced, but I've seen them trying to enforce it in a couple of situations. So watch out for that, okay? Um, code upgrade coverage. Um, they're now required to offer code upgrade coverage when you buy your policy. I think they're required to offer 10%. You can usually add on. Um, uh, AAA has a policy where it's not an additional limit that you stack on top. Um, most of the policies stack it on top. Check your endorsement. Um, so We'll get to this in a minute, but California Insurance Code 2051.5 lets you use all of your coverages, but especially code upgrade coverage to buy a replacement home or rebuild elsewhere. 
David. So, um, and yes, we will uh, we'll have a recording of this. So um, it will be posted in the next couple of days on our website. So yes, you'll be able to see it. Um, so this pays for upgrades to your home that are required to add. So you didn't have, say, solar on your house, and now you have to do it. It's things that you didn't have that now you have to add to bring your home that you lost up to current code, okay? And we're gonna have a lot on this. This is probably the most uh, difficult coverage to understand and most important, okay? So here is um, a sample. Look for the words additional amount of insurance, okay? Because usually it stacks on top. Um, here's another one. This is not an additional amount of insurance. So that just tells you um, that you need to read it. But so this one, look, you're reading through, you've got your building ordinance or law coverage, not an additional amount of insurance. Don't stop reading because look at this one. And I think this is, I think this is Safeco. Um, if you have a declared catastrophe, the limit available for building ordinance or law shall be increased by 100%. OK, they have that for extended replacement cost, too. So this is why the fine print, the, the guy who showed me this found it about a year and a half after his loss. So really important to read the fine prints. And um, this is this is the same one, extended dwelling coverage amount. OK, it tells you additional 100 percent, da, da, da. Look at this. You get another 100 percent, twice the percentage. So this is a really good um, endorsement. Okay, this is another, um, oops, that's one I showed you already, that's a mistake. Um, so we're gonna get a little bit into the math here, know your limits, okay, this coverage A, and I'm sorry, I'm speeding up, sorry interpreters, I'm trying to go slow and get through this. Um, this is just gonna be like how you take your coverage A, add your extended replacement cost add your debris removal, add your code upgrade, add your tree shrubs and plants. There's also some policies have some inflation coverage, okay? So you can add them on and your policy, which you think is $500,000, when you add 25% ERC, 20% code upgrade, 5% debris removal. I didn't even add the trees on this and it's seven seven fifty. So that's that's, increased by 50%. So um, you're gonna need that because most people are underinsured. So um, this is really important. This is why knowing what you have in your policy is so valuable. Uh, make a little chart, okay? This is just a little chart. This is just where you just make a chart and fill it in and see what you have. Remember some policies, the debris removal applies to all the coverages, it's dwelling, other structure, contents, trees, okay? So a policy that you think is 421 is actually 1.2 million, okay? I'm not gonna touch on inflation coverage, just you might have it. Most companies update it every once a year when your policy renews every once in a while. It doesn't, you might wanna look for it. It's very small usually, but it's, uh, inflation's getting worse, so it might become more important. Um, okay, the flow of insurance funds, okay? What they usually do, a lot of times your insurance company will give you advances. Once the value is set, then they'll pay you your actual cash value payment. And then you get your replacement cost when you show them that you have um, done the replacement. Now, a lot of times if you're underinsured, you can get all of this up front, okay? So these are just some things. Consider opening a separate bank account to keep track. Get your buckets and know what your buckets are. We have an example of an insurance, a full Excel spreadsheet that has all the little slots that you can just fill in. It's an uphelp.org samples. Okay, so I've got three little slides here on codes that are codes you need to know, and then we'll get to all the questions. Um, 2051, it's very important. If you have lost your home 
after January 1st, 2020, the method for valuing your house has changed. Um, insurance companies used to be able to get a fair market value appraisal. It's really important to understand that um, there's a big difference between uh, an appraisal of your property with what it would fetch on the open market and the cost to rebuild your property, okay? So for instance, I live in San Francisco. So the market value of my house is pretty high. Well, it's not a very big house. So the replacement cost relative to the market value is much lower. In a lot of areas where there are fires, the, the, the cost to buy a new house is a little bit lower but the cost to build a house is super high. So you need to be really aware of, um, and James, I see your question about inflation cost coverage. We'll post that and you can go through each um, policy uh, calculates it, it differently. So um, it's not a straight, straight line. You have to read your policy to know how to calculate inflation. Um, anyway. So they used to be able to get an, whoopsie, get an appraisal and pay you the ACV based upon an appraisal of your home. And then you would get a replacement cost estimate. How much does it cost to rebuild? Now the law says, insurance code 2051 says that actual cash value must be determined by taking the replacement cost. What does it cost to rebuild this home? less reasonable depreciation, okay? And it also says that you can only depreciate items that wear out, okay? Carpeting, paint, roofs, things like that. You know, the framing inside my walls here, that doesn't, it doesn't wear out. It'll be here for a couple hundred years. So um, that is now the law. So if you've been given an appraisal, um, as your initial ACV payment, go back to your insurer and say, great, thank you, give me a replacement cost estimate. Okay, insurance code 2051, my favorite insurance code, although they've revised it as of July 1st. Um, it tells you, and this is the most important part, what your in insurance company owes you when you have a loss is the cost to repair or replace the thing that you lost, your house, your belongings, okay, anything like that, up to the policy limits, okay? My interpretation is that that, that means all limits, including extended replacement costs um, and code upgrades, but some of the insurers don't agree with me. Um, so it's really important, even if you have no intention of rebuilding the home you lost, you must, okay, you must determine how much it would cost to rebuild it exactly as it was. The only time you don't need that estimate is if your insurance company pays you all of your limits, okay? So one of the traps that, and it wasn't necessarily an intentional trap, but it's just a, you know, that I'm seeing with people um, in the Paradise Fire is, you know, they're like, oh, everything's great. Everything's fine. My insurance company paid me my limits and you know, I'm gonna go about my business and I'll repair, I'll replace my house, you know, buy a new house and then they'll pay me the rest. They're, they're holding the extended replacement. Some of the companies hold extended replacement costs. Um, well, then they go and buy a house and the insurance company is like, ah, well, your old house wasn't worth as much as this new house. Um, so you really, the amount that they owe you is the cost to replace what you lost. That has no bearing on what you buy or what you build, okay? So only in certain situations, the only, you can build whatever you want, you can buy whatever you want. Certain policies, certain companies require you to spend that money that they're holding um, before they're gonna release it to you. Okay, so I know that's very complicated and we'll have other webinars that'll talk about that. Um, so 2051.5 is the magic uh, code that extends your time to collect your replacement cost benefits, that amount that they're holding back 
for 36 months, you can get additional time. It also expressly allows you to use all of your insurance coverages to rebuild elsewhere or to buy a replacement home, including ERC and code. Um, some of the carriers uh, nationwide are, is not going along with this. So some people are having to litigate, um, but most of the carriers are, are understanding that this is, this is a, a law that's intended to help people get back into home ownership after a fire. Um, also the newest modification on this, which is the main part that came in on in 2021 is that insurers may not apply a land value deduction. So um, that shouldn't apply to any of you. If you hear the words land value deduction, come to UP and we'll talk about it. This is new effective uh, 2021. They moved the additional living expense portion um, out of 2051.5 and into its own code that now has its own code for ALE, no less than 24 months, allows up to 36 months in the event of a declared disaster. And um, if delays are unavoidable, you have alternative remedies and you have extra coverage. Okay, last one, uh, 2061 says insurers must provide four months advances of ALE upon the request of the insured. They can't require specific forms for your contents inventory and you can group categories of items. So you don't have to list, you know, uh, four forks and six spoons and you know, all that you can group them together now, which is very nice. Okay. Uh, these are just things to remember. The California has a Fair Claim Settlement Practices Act. You get 15 days to respond to communications. That means anything, email. And it actually, the law says immediately, but in no instance, more than 15 days. So um, hold their feet to the fire. You deserve uh, reasonable communications. 40 days to pay or deny a claim. And that doesn't mean just like your big claim. It means like if you send in some receipts for additional living expenses, they have 40 days to either pay them or deny them or tell you that they can't make a decision. And really, um, a lot of times you'll see these letters saying, we're still looking at your claim. They don't really tell you much other than they're still evaluating it. What they're supposed to do is... Um, send you a letter saying, you know, what do they need to make a decision? How long do they need to make a decision? You know, and send that letter every 30 days. So super important. Um, there's claim handling reforms. Uh, make sure a lot of adjusters are out of state. Ask them if they know about, if they've been trained in the fair claim settlement practices regulations, ask them for an advance. Um, I didn't include it here, but there's also a law if you have three adjusters in a six month period, um, you're entitled to a single point of contact, one person and, and access to that person's supervisor. Okay, so these are the best practices we showed you in advance. Um, we wanna urge you, we have stay connected. You know, this is a really, um, UP has a saying, and I'm gonna get to the questions in two seconds here. Um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. This is a very um, stressful, complicated, long um, and arduous process. I'm sorry to say that, but it is. And so um, interfacing with other people who've gone through it and come out the other side is super valuable. We have survivor to survivor webinars that you can join. If you run into a problem, you can call the California Department of Insurance. You can just pick up the phone and call them. Um, you can also uh, file a formal complaint. So a lot of times, you know, pick up the, call, the phone. I've had a kind of mixed results on some of the, some of the answers, but because every once in a while, I call them up to see what they say. But it's always worth a shot. Okay, again, thank you to our funders who made this possible. Our help library is hugely valuable. Um, you can find all sorts of stuff, whoopsie, all sorts of stuff there. We do have a little search bar and whoopsie, I'm going to stop this, go here. Um, but a lot of uh, things are in the, okay. 
Um, okay, and Elise has posted some great links. That's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop the recording um, and we're gonna do, now nah, maybe I'll keep going. We'll do the Q and A so people have um, questions. Okay, and I'm just gonna start at the top. So Alice says, how does loss of use work for vacation homes? We uh, have another place to live, obviously, but now we don't have access to recreational home overnight. Is it possible with the loss of use to rent a vacation home here, here and there for a week or weekend while waiting to start and finish your rebuild? So Alice, um, like you saw when we were going through the policies, you need to look and make sure, but most of the policies say increased costs to maintain your standard of living. So to me, it really depends on how did you use that vacation home before. Um, with COVID, people who maybe used to go sporadically to their vacation homes, you know, for the last couple of years have been going maybe half time. Um, I think that you're, you can totally rent a vacation home here and there for a week or weekend. Um, I think you'd be, if your policy doesn't specifically exclude that, I think you're entitled to that. Um, you're also, you know, some people use their homes a lot and they store things there. They have, you know, clothing specific for the area or whatever. Um, you can ask for them to rent you a vacation home in the same area in most cases. And sometimes uh, the insurers push back, ask where does it say that in my policy that it's not covered? So, um, so go ahead and you had a vacation home. That is your standard of living. You're entitled to one. Okay, Debbie says, are you required to build the house after a total loss to obtain the ERC or does it apply if we choose to sell the property and purchase a home elsewhere? Yes, it does. You can, um, rebuild somewhere else you can buy somewhere else you can do any of those things and you are entitled to take it with you it's a very very good um good addition to california law okay james says can you give some notes on loss of use of second home so i think we've done that i think it's a policy specific and b how do you use your vacation home so I think that I've seen a lot of insurers push back on second homes. And just because the adjuster thinks you have a place to live, it doesn't say if you have nowhere else to live, we'll rent you another house. It says if your home becomes uninhabitable, we pay the increased cost to maintain your standard of living. So that's the important part. Always ask for the policy. And then Cindy, in the case of a second home, how long can you reasonably expect them to pay for loss of use? Can it be as long as it takes to rebuild or find another home? And yes, it can. Um, the challenges to rebuilding, you know, are gonna be pretty site specific, um, you know, depending on where your home is located, the permitting process, do you, there's a lot of decisions that go into deciding whether you're gonna buy or rebuild. And you need to make an informed decision. I've seen a lot of heat put on um, by the insurance carriers to try to get people to make decisions. And I understand, you know, they don't wanna just pay while people are hanging out, but, but you do, you are entitled to having an informed decision. Also, do not let any carrier push you to decide to buy or rebuild if you don't have an agreement on how much they owe you overall. How much would it cost to rebuild the home you lost? I talked to some people, and I was at a conference last week, um, and talked to some people who were dealing with um, carriers, and they're like saying, oh, well, you have until the end of three months from today to decide whether you're gonna buy, rebuild or what you're gonna do. Well, they hadn't reached an agreement on how much they were owed. How can you make an informed decision on buying or rebuilding if you don't know how much money you have? Only super rich people can do that. You know, that's ridiculous. So 
So don't let that happen and write to them and tell them, how can I make a decision if we haven't reached an agreement on how much it costs to rebuild my house? Um, Lynn says, how does a declared disaster, federal disaster affect your policy? Well, we saw some examples and that's a very rare policy that doubles some of your limits. But in general, the declared federal disaster unlocks some of these benefits, unlocks the extended additional 12 months for ALE. Um, it unlocks, um, I'm trying to think, I think the portability, I'm trying to think the portability, I've, I've got to read it all the time, but it is um, important. Sometimes if you're, if, if the disaster line is near you, they'll, they'll scoop you in, but um, it, it is helpful. It does add some, some things. Okay, Amy says, California Fair said they only do 16 months. So I'm assuming it doesn't say, if you're still here, Amy, type something in. I'm assuming you mean 16 months of ALE. Um, I'm not sure. I am, I am aware that the FAIR plan, and the FAIR plan has some interesting smoke language that's being challenged in the courts. There's a lot going on with the FAIR plan now. Um, a lot of people are forced to have these policies. They're pretty bare bones. Um, it's, it's got some limits. Um, it is, you know, it's, it's basic protection, but um, I, I understand that the FAIR plan is making an argument that some of the provisions in 20, 2060 on ALA, for instance, doesn't apply to them. Um, if you're having problems with California Fair Plan limiting your coverage, um, not just your coverage, like your policy limit, but if they're saying, you know, you only get 16 months of ALE, uh, reach out to us, uh, drop a line to info at uphelp.org. And I know I owe a bunch of people responses. I've just, I've been overwhelmed. Um, let me know or join one of our Q&A sessions and you're guaranteed pretty much to get it uh, answered there. So, okay. So Debbie, let me see if Amy said, oh, correct is ALE. Yeah, Amy, um, there is some things going on with that. So uh, drop us a line and we'll see, I'll see what's going on. I'm not sure what the, um, what the status is. Okay, Debbie, I lost my home in the Fawn fire. I'm sorry. How long does it take for FEMA to decide if that fire will be part of their program for debris removal? I have no idea. It really depends. Um, the bigger fires obviously um, get the declaration faster. Um, one of the things that we've seen in California is that they group the fires together and you know the it, it happened after the complex fires last year they group them together um so i i don't know um there are fema liaisons out there um they're called um vals voluntary agency liaisons so try to get a hold of one of them and see what they're going to say but unfortunately i don't have much uh about fema and then Bonnie says, does FEMA, your insurance for your limit? Uh, Bonnie, you need to clarify your question because I'm not sure what your question is. Um, sometimes FEMA will deny your claims because you have insurance, um, even if you're underinsured. I'm assuming that's what this question is about. Keep going back. There's an appeal process. Keep going back and resubmitting it because generally after once your claim is settled and it's determined that you're underinsured then they'll go ahead and approve your loan or whatever so cindy if your home is on located on u.s forest service land are the damaged trees covered you know i've been thinking about this uh as i've been jabbering away you know technically in order to insure property you have to have what's called an insurable interest. 
So I happen to know a little bit about Cindy's lease, but I, I know you've been paying property taxes. I would probably push it. I mean, technically you don't own the property, but the 99 year leases are like an ownership interest. They're really different than like if I had a month to month tenancy on a property. So I would say yes, but I would need a lawyer to weigh in on that. Somebody would probably have to look at the, the lease agreement and all of that. So I wish I could be more specific. Okay, David asked if he had to make repairs or could he buy another house? So we did answer that. You can absolutely buy or rebuild elsewhere. And David says, hi, David. Um, what percentage amount of building code upgrade do you recommend to ask for? And that's good, uh, 10, 25, or 50, and why? Um, thanks, David, uh, good question. Uh, although this is a claim, so we've, most people have already had a loss, David's an insurance agent. Um, but it is important um, that you look at those, and like, for instance, my house was just rebuilt um, three years ago, everything's up to code, it's earthquake, all that stuff. So I only have 10%. Um, if I lived in a Victorian that maybe had an older foundation or no upgrades and stuff like that, then I'd go 50 or 100%. So you really need to be individual on the age of your house, how much has been upgraded, and then also uh, what you know, where do you live? And does, is your town strict or is your town not strict or, and things like that? Okay, thanks, David. Um, Alice, once your insurance company sends you money, your depositing it does not end your interaction, right? You can still request further money. Yes, there is also a law in California that says that just accepting the money is not a release. Um, if you worry about things like that, and I think it's a good practice anyway, to just write and say, thank you for the payment for X, um, appreciate it. Um, I'm currently, you know, obtaining an estimate to determine whether the amount is adequate. You know, you can do anything, but no, you do, you can still ask for money. Um, there are time limits to sue, but those time limits have been getting longer and longer. Another benefit of a federally declared disaster is that you get another, an extra year to file a lawsuit. So that is in, in a lot of cases, some, some insurance companies are extending it in their policy to two years. Um, but if your policy says 12 months from the date of loss, then you get an extra month. So how does inflation cover ca coverage calculate? So that's specific to every policy. You have to go into your policy, find your inflation coverage language if you have it and see how they calculate it because they'll tell you right in there. Okay, uh, Kane says, when combining all, sorry, I'm blind. Um, combining all insurance to buy or replace, do they also mean the personal property um, portion? So um, you can use, like say, I mean, a lot of people don't replace everything. You can, you can submit your inventory, get your policy limits, okay? Um, and as far as the ACV, you can do anything you want with it. You can keep the money and go to Vegas, whatever. Um, if you want to get your replacement cost benefits, okay? If, if say for instance, the actual cash value of your contents doesn't reach the coverage limits and they say, okay, um, you say you had $300,000 of coverage, you submitted claims totaling $310,000 and dep they depreciated and they paid you 250. Okay, so you've got another $50,000 there. To get that $50,000 in what we call replacement cost benefits, some companies call it holdbacks, in order to get it, you have to go and replace those items, turn in the receipts and release the money. Um, if you're underinsured, you'll, you, you'll get the whole bucket. You can do whatever you want with it and you can use it um, toward rebuilding your house, okay? If you're underinsured or if you wanna upgrade. Um, okay, well, 
so, so he modified his question. For example, I'm wondering if I have $300,000 in personal property line items, but didn't cover in coverage, but didn't lose $300,000 of personal items. Can I apply that 300,000 to the rebuild of my property? And the answer to that is no. Um, in order to collect the money, you have to have lost the items. So you can't just take, these coverage limits aren't automatic, none of them. Um, that's kind of an old thing. They used to have these things called stated value policies. It's like your house is insured for 300. If it burns to the ground, you get 300. That was it. That it, easiest claims ever, right? I loved that. Um, it was a recipe for insurance fraud because people would just burn their houses down. That is why they stopped doing that. So you have to actually itemize and lose the actual items and claim them to get the money. But then once you get the money, if you did lose the items, um, you can apply it towards your house. So, and we are very clear to say only claim items you actually lost. Okay, Haley, if you decide to rebuild out of state in California, do the California insurance codes apply to your coverage since the policy originated in California? And the answer to that is yes. Um, the code and the policies kind of like stamp the day the fire happens. So you could cancel your insurance policy. We don't recommend it, okay? Because it has some other coverages. Um, but you could cancel your policy the day after the fire and your claim would still be fine. The benefits would still be there and the laws would still look still apply. Um, after the Tubbs fire a few years ago, I helped a guy um, relocate and buy a house in Ireland. Doesn't matter any place. So that is one of the benefits. And keep in mind, you guys, most states do not have this benefit. So it's a really nice thing to have. What if your contents is less than what you've been paid? Do you have to return the money? Um, is it an advance? I don't know. Voluntary advances um, are done. So contents advances are voluntary. They're done at the, at the discretion of the insurance company. And usually they'll give you some language that applies to that saying you can have this. And if you want more, you have to make a list. Um, I'd say that if they voluntarily, voluntarily gave you to advance your fine, um, but if it's less than you've been, that's the only time I could think that your loss would be less than you've been paid. Okay. Cause we certainly don't want you to make up items on a list. Okay. So David, uh, technically there's no ALE coverage in the fair plan, only fair rental value. Thank you. Yes. And that is a clarification and I agree with that. So, um, that is good. Okay, James is asking for forest service cabins. If you own the improvements, i.e. the ca cabin, you can sell it or transfer it to families. Um, yeah, I just don't know enough about those, ca those situations. And, you know, there's leases involved that I haven't read. So um, I think in general, you'd get your, your, I mean, you're going to get paid for the building. So I don't know why, if you're going to get paid for the building, why you wouldn't get paid for the, for the trees that Cindy was asking about earlier. But it's, it's definitely something a little outside of my wheelhouse. Bonnie, will the FEMA bill the insurance for your debris removal? For instance, if you have 14000 for debris removal, will they bill the insurance for 14 k or is debris removal free if you have FEMA involved? So debris removal isn't free. And I'm going to preface this by saying that um, every uh, municipality, county um, negotiates a different deal with FEMA. So I can't make a blanket statement like what uh, Sonoma County did for the Tubbs fire is a little bit different than what Paradise did for the campfire. But in general, um, the agreements that you sign, it's called a right of entry form that you would have signed when you opted in to the FEMA Consolidated Debris Removal Program. Um, 
that would outline how how the benefits are paid. So in most cases, if you have that 5% debris as an additional coverage on your policy, the agreement says that's all they're going to take. So you have to take that 5% and either your insurance company is going to hold it, or if they pay you, you have to hold it, keep it aside, and you have to pay that. Um, there's a few cases, and again, this is individual that say if you have to use it for something else if you keep your receipts you can carve out but you need to talk to your county about that because that's it's not standard it's not an insurance issue um and then fema generally does bill the insurance company but insurers differ on whether they keep the funds or give the funds to you and the only time debris removal is free um, is generally when you don't have that extra 5% and it's documentable that you need the coverage in order to rebuild your house. Like you wouldn't be able to rebuild your house at all if you didn't have that 5%. But again, I'm going to um, put you back to the counties because that's a totally sort of even though the insurance pays for a little bit, it's outside of the insurance route. Okay, so I'm sorry, it's been almost two hours. Thank you for the 27 of you who have hung on um, this long. I'm sorry that you had to be here um, to do this, uh, but we're trying to you know, sort of help you get through it. Um, I apologize, I don't have, uh, you're welcome. Um, I don't have a slide on upcoming events, but register with our website, uphelp.org. Most of you probably already have. And if you go to the events section, um, you'll have a list of upcoming events. You can also go to past events. That's where this webinar will be posted um, in a few days. Um, Carolyn, who posts them, is on vacation for a couple of days, but she'll be back. Um, and you can revisit, this is a ton of information. Like I said, you know, there's attorneys that spend their whole careers specializing in this. So um, anyway, uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Hang in there. This is a really long haul. I'm sorry that you all have to go through it, but um, we're gonna be here and try to get you out the other side. So thank you so much and keep an eye out. And uh, I will be having a Q&A. So I really encourage you, if you have questions, that's the easiest way to get your questions answered um, because my inbox is um, very, very backed up. And I know that um, there are people, people waiting for things. And if you get me on a Q&A webinar, then I'm forced to answer the question. So anyway, be safe, have a great night, and I will see you all soon. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.